Heavenly Father, we pray that you will move in our midst and work in our hearts tonight or this morning as we as we get into your word and as we study it. I pray that you'll hammer the truth of it on the door of our hearts so that we so that we will be changed by it and so that we'll carry it with us as we go from here. We pray that you will conform us further through this, your word, to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray these things in his name. Amen. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the, with the story that was written about 600 years before the New Testament. It's not a biblical story, uh, but it is a story about a shepherd boy who watched, he, he watched a flock of sheep near the village, and very often he liked to yell something. What did he like to yell? Anybody know? Wolf, right? All right. This is one of Aesop's fables, Greek poet. And he'd yell wolf, and the neighbors would come out, and then he would laugh at them, because they all came out and, ha ha, made you look, made you come. And uh, then one day, the wolf truly came. And so the shepherd boy began to yell, wolf, nobody came. And so the wolf ate all of his sheep. You know what? There's no believing a liar even when they're telling the truth, right? And uh, so there's, you know, there are many virtues that, that are distinctly Christian. There are virtues, there are, there are facets of the Christian life as we discussed in Sunday school this morning. We talked about uh, how your light as a Christian shows... Uh, exposes the darkness around you if, you're, if the light of Christ is shining in you. There are things about Christians that are unique to Christians. Uh, and, and, and there is, but there is one virtue that is supposed to be in the Christian life that is not only Christian, but it is praised by all of, all, all of the world heaps praise on the issue of integrity, the virtue of integrity. That doesn't mean all the world has it, but they all recognize it and they all praise it. Let me just give you a couple of a couple of quotes from people that are not necessarily Christians that talk about integrity and honesty. Um, Albert Einstein said this, whoever is careless with the truth in small matters cannot be trusted with important matters. Uh, let's get as far away from Christian as possible. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic and persecutor of Christians, the uh, Roman emperor said, if it is not true, do not say it. Uh, Spencer Johnson, author of a book that was popular when I was in school called Who Moved My Cheese, um, he said, integrity is telling myself the truth and honesty is telling the truth to other people. Samuel Johnson, the British uh, poet and, and essayist said, uh, there, are, there can be no friendship without confidence and no confidence without integrity. Now, these quotes, praising honesty and integrity, they can go on forever. I'm not brilliant. I just Googled it, all right, and uh, came up with a, a big list. And, and I literally could spend all morning giving you uh, quotes uh, about how people, no matter what background they come from, uh, look at honesty and they look at integrity as a virtue that people should have. Everybody recognizes that need. So, why is dishonesty such a problem in the world? I mean, you think about it. Politicians? Uh, Red Skelton used to tell this joke. So if it's corny, I'll blame him. But there's two guys on a... They were, they were in Africa near a village and a lion sprung out at them and they both began to run. The one guy fell down, the other guy made it safe to the village. Well, he assumed his friend got eaten. Well, about an hour later, his friend showed up in the village unscathed. He said, how did you escape that lion? And his, and, and his friend said to him, well, the lion was about to eat me, and I told him that I was a politician and that I was going to cut taxes. He said, not even a lion could swallow that. So, um, that wasn't in the notes. But uh, anyway, so, you, you know, you got... Politicians, you have sports stars. I, I heard an interview with a baseball player that had been, uh, they, they believed he had been doing steroids or some kind of thing like that. And he just swore up and down on his, I mean, on everything sacred and holy that he had not touched. So of course, the test came back very positive, uh, and so that didn't work out for him. Um, 
news reporters, um, con artists, I mean, you, you, I, I could go on, all right? But there's just an honesty problem in, in America, in the world. The, the world's full of people who are not honesty, yet, or, yet are not honest, but yet we all, we all praise that virtue. We all recognize the need for it. Um, now let's, let's just forget about the rest of the world for now and focus inside this building, all right? Let's focus on Christians, the church. We can expect unsaved people to act like unsaved people, can we not? But uh, they, they've got nothing beyond themselves to enable them to be honest all the time. And so one of the, one of the most despicable things, one of the problems... One of the biggest spots on the garments of the Bride of Christ is the dishonest Christian, the saint who is known only for lies or for, for hypocrisy hurts the cause of Christ. You know, everybody can be honest in some things. Even dishonest people. We can be honest in what we want to be honest about. But integrity in the Christian life requires honesty in all things. And that's really where the, the rubber meets the road. Honesty is the only policy for the Christian. And we're, we're held to God's standard, that's why. And so it's not that we should be honest most of the time, and then there are some exceptions where we, where we can get away with, with a little bit of shadiness. How can we be honest in all things? I mean, I know me, you know you. How can we accomplish this? The obvious answer for the Christian to say, well, God helps us. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And yes, that is true. And yes, that's how it's done. But Jesus enables us to have His integrity. That's true. But how does it work? What does that look like in real life? We talk about the Holy Spirit's work. We talk about uh, God working in us this way many times. But nobody ever really pins that down to actually what it means. We kind of leave it up in the clouds in this nebulous, move, movable thing that makes us comfortable because we don't really have to deal with it. And so, uh, how does integrity work? How does God work that out in our Christian life? Well, here's how it works, alright? Integrity for the Christian is possible because we have a witness. And you can always be honest if you believe that God is always your witness. If you believe that there is never a word that comes out of your mouth that God does not know, that God does not judge, and that God does not remember or hear, uh, then you will understand that God is always your witness, whether you call on Him to be your witness or not. And so you can always be honest as a Christian. This is how it works. You have the Holy Spirit living inside your heart if you are saved and born again tonight, this morning, and, and uh, I know we, we, we remember that, we bear that in mind, but sometimes you don't think about the fact that God is our witness always, and we can always be honest, you can always be honest, and I can always be honest, if we believe that God is always our witness. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addressed this subject to people who followed the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and, and the religious leaders of their time. And the Pharisees taught something that on the surface it looked like integrity, it looked great. Uh, but when Jesus began to dig a little deeper, found out that it was nothing but dishonesty. It was nothing but just human beings being sinful and trying to get away from God's law. Jesus' main concern in His sermon was to show uh, how to have greater righteousness than the Pharisees. He said, uh, he said unless your, your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so he is trying to drive that point home in this sermon. Jesus gives six illustrations to drive, it, drive the nail in where it's supposed to be. And in each illustration, Jesus takes a common teaching that the Pharisees uh, have and he demonstrates how really it breaks God's law and misses the point and falls short of God's righteousness. And he exposed their teaching on murder, exposed their teaching on lust, and their teaching on divorce. And, and now we come to Jesus' 
expose on their teaching about oaths, swearing oaths and telling the truth. Jesus states what the Pharisees teach about oaths. He exposes what's wrong with it, and then he demonstrates what God's real purpose for an oath is and what God's real purpose uh, for including that in his law would be. In studying the passage this morning, we're going to learn how to be honest in all things. You can always be honest if God is always your witness and you believe that. Uh, Jesus teaches us three key truths, really, that are help us remember that God is always our witness and help us to be honest. Three key things, that uh, three key truths that will help us to believe that God is always our witness and not waver in that. And so we find these key truths in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 33, beginning there, if you're not there with me yet. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll read verses 33 through 37. Jesus says here again, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself. Forswear means to swear falsely. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, or nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these come cometh of evil. And so here in this passage of Scripture, Jesus exposes what the Pharisees teach about taking an oath in the Lord's name. And he, he uh, takes what looks great on the surface, digs below, finds the problem and shows us what true honesty is in God's righteousness. The first key truth that he gives us to help us remember that, that uh, you can always be honest if you believe God is always your witness, he gives us three truths to drive this home to us. The first key truth is this. You must remember that God is your witness when you tell the truth. Now that one's the, that's the, you say, what? Now that's, that's easy. We want to remember that. Yeah, it's not all bad, all right? Uh, remember that God is your witness when you tell the truth. When, when you are speaking and it lines up with what is right and what is true, God takes notice and he's your witness. Um, I've watched my fair share of, of courtroom dramas on television, you know, and, and the one thing that really speaks or sticks out in my mind is where they swear in the witness. And what they do, they, they put their hand on the Bible and they, and they say, I solemnly swear to tr tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. What does that mean? So help me God. Well, what they're really saying is, I am calling on God as my witness to testify to the fact that I am telling the truth in my testimony here in, in this courtroom. And under oath, the witness can face heavy fines or even imprisonment if he tells a lie, right? It's called perjury. And, and uh, he can go to jail, he can pay great money. Uh, it's pretty serious when you, when you take an oath. And, uh, and the, the, the key thing we need to remember is that God is your witness when you tell the truth. Now, Jesus reminds his audience of, of what the Pharisees taught concerning oaths. And on the surface, this sounds great, but uh, they, they taught that you must not swear falsely, for swear yourself. Don't, don't swear an oath in God's name and break that oath. That's what they're saying. But they qualified that. Thou shalt, let's, let's look here again in verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, Here's their qualification, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Now, um, they're saying, when you take an oath in the Lord's name, you better keep it. Now that's true, but they're leaving things out. Uh, but we're, what we're getting at here is the fact that God is your witness when you tell the truth. And the Pharisees were happy about that. We're happy about that. Uh, when, when you tell the truth, you want God to attest to it. You want Him to hear where do they get their teaching from, the Pharisees? They usually didn't make these things up, all right? You know, the Old Testament is full of verses, full of laws about taking oaths. There's a group of, of uh, people there, there, that interpret Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 7, 
and they say you should never ever swear an oath even in a courtroom. That's not what Jesus is teaching because he said back in verses 17 through 19, he said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And to change what God says in the Old Testament, Jesus would have to destroy that. So he's really talking about taking oaths for the wrong reasons and breaking them. But where did the, where did the Pharisees get their teaching about oaths? Well, they got it, first of all, from Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Uh, this is in the Ten Commandments. It says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. What does it mean to take the name of the Lord your God in vain? Well, we commonly call it call swearing when someone uses the name of Christ or the name of God in an expletive. And by the way, I am not letting those people off the hook. You should not do that, all right? But to be, to, to be biblical, a person took the name of the Lord their God in the Old Testament in an oath. They called on God's name and swore by His name. And if they broke that oath, then they had taken God's name in that oath in vain. You understand what I'm saying there? And so that's what Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7 uh, taught. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 12, the Pharisees would have known this. The Bible says, And ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. So to swear an oath by God's name and then to, to do it falsely, to break that oath, was in, in God's word here an act of profanity, to take God's name and make it less than, than what it really meant, to make it less than holy. Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2 says this, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word, he shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Again, the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, uh, had some pretty strict guidelines about swearing an oath. Now the Pharisees took these and many other scriptures and they applied them to real life. And that's what God's people should do. They should take His Word and apply it to real life. So they did that. They applied it to practical life. And what Jesus is quoting here in verse 33 is not exactly word for word going to be in the Old Testament because he's now quoting what the Pharisees taught, which is a principle drawn on those several things we just looked at. Jesus quotes their phrase. He says, it's been, you've, again, you've heard that it's been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. That sounds like a pretty good summary of what we just read, doesn't it? Um, and so he quoted this. Um, According to the letter of the law, which is what the Pharisees liked, they were correct in their application. Now, the Pharisees loved oaths. And, and uh, the people of Jesus' day, we don't really go around swearing oaths all the time, but the people of Jesus' day, uh, in his culture, loved them. Why? Why did they love those things? Well, it's because they were biblical, for one. Uh, God swore an oath to Abraham. Genesis chapter 22, God said, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And God swore an oath, and, and the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6, revisits that and says, God could swear by nothing greater, so he swore by his own name. He swore an oath to Abraham. Abraham had his servant go to, to take a wife for his son Isaac, and he said, swear to me that you will not take a bride for Isaac of these Canaanite women, these unbelievers. He says, I don't want my son to be married to an idolater and to be unequally yoked. He didn't say unequally yoked, but that's what he meant, all right? And he said, don't, he says, swear an oath by God's name. If you read Genesis chapter 24, Abraham's servant swore an oath by God's name. He would not take a Canaanite bride for Isaac. Jonathan and David, 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 16, they swore an oath together. That oath resulted in it, when Jonathan was dead and Saul was dead, David showed great favor to a grandson of Saul that by the name of Mephibosheth. Instead of, instead of killing Mephibosheth like was the, the uh, common thing done in the Middle East at that time, he showed great favor to the son of his enemy, to the grandson of his enemy. And uh, that was a result of an oath that David kept. When Israel returned from their Babylonian captivity, 
in Nehemiah chapter 10 and verse 29, they swore an oath, the Bible says actually, that they entered into a curse. They took an oath upon themselves that, that God would curse them if they stopped walking in his law. That's Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 29. The Mosaic law gives several, several examples of, of swearing an oath by God's name, and it's sanctioned, it's, it's, uh, it's blessed in God's Word. The Mosaic Law gives strict instructions about oaths, which we read. And so oaths are biblical. The Pharisees liked them because of that. They, they did love the Old Testament. Um, and then they loved oaths because they established credibility, which is, which is the main reason. I mean, sinful human beings are naturally truthful when it's convenient, and less so when it's inconvenient, right? What we read this morning, Psalm chapter 15, uh, it starts out with this, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And then later on, verse 4, it says, it answers the question, it says, He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. The psalmist commends this as a man that swears an oath, and it hurts him to carry out the oath, but he's true to the oath, He's true to his word. This is the kind of person that will abide in your tabernacle and in your holy hill. The psalmist commends this as an uncommon virtue because human nature is by nature, by sinful nature, we are deceivers. The oath in God's name calls him as your witness that you are telling the truth. And that's what we want, right? We want to tell the truth. We want God to know about it when we tell the truth. We want God to attest to our words that they're faithful to the truth. People use phrases like, with God as my witness, I'm telling you, or I swear to God, or may lightning strike me from heaven if, if, uh, if I actually made a birdie on this hole instead of a double bogey, right? Uh, that, I mean, we, we wouldn't, I wouldn't use that, but uh, anyway, people invoke God's name all the time, knowing that God is your witness when you tell the truth, ought to be a comfort to a believer. You know, there's times when you tell the truth and nobody believes you. You ever been there? You tell the truth and maybe it's improbable. And, and, and people misjudge your motives, perhaps, when you tell the truth. Perhaps they misjudge you and they lie about you and they spread rumors about you. And you know what, Christian, take great comfort in the fact that God is your witness. And what he thinks is more important than what they think because we can cast all of our cares upon him. He cares for you. You know, you'll never be able to prove the truth to people who don't want to see it. But God sees it. He is your witness when you tell the truth. And so the Old Testament law said that, uh, that you'd, you better do what you say if you swear an oath in the name of the Lord. The consequences were pretty bad. Anybody can take comfort in the fact, though, that God is our witness when we tell the truth. If God is always your witness, and He bears witness as you tell the truth, He also bears witness at other times, too. Times that aren't so comforting. And so Jesus tells us, remember, God is your witness when you tell the truth. But here's something else, another great truth to remember. Remember that God is your witness when you tell a lie. Remember that uh, as badly as you want God to hear when you tell the truth, when you tell a lie, He hears it just as loud and just as clear as when you tell the truth. God is our witness when you tell a lie. We've got to remember that truth. It's here that Jesus begins to deal with and expose the problem that the Pharisees had in their application of, of the laws of God on oaths. Look at verse 34 with me. He says, but I say unto you, it's, here we continue with this, this um, formula, you have heard, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever more, of these, more than this comes of evil. He, uh, the problem here was not that they taught that you should keep your oaths to the Lord. It's not what they taught about it, 
The problem is what they taught about keeping your word when you did not take an oath to the Lord. All right? That's, it's what they left out that Jesus brings to the surface. They were fine when they said, keep your oath when you take it to the Lord. But the problem was that's not all that they were teaching. They were, that was kind of the main thesis statement. But on the, on the flip side of that, they were teaching that if you didn't take an oath in the Lord's name, it wasn't as binding. You could get out of it. You could break your word. You know, God intended oaths to be taken only under proper circumstances. And this was the problem. The rabbinic tradition allowed for oaths to be sworn in any circumstance. And the result was that they'd go around and they'd take an oath here and there and everywhere. And, and pretty soon an oath did not establish credibility. In fact, have you ever known a person that has to swear up and down every time they want you to believe them? Do you believe them? <laughs> not me. Um, and that's what was, that they, they were exposing their shady character. The Pharisees taught that you could swear by things lesser than God's name. You know, if you really did mean it, you better swear by God's name. But I mean, if you were pretty sure, maybe 85%, 70%, something like that, go ahead and swear by something, but not God's name. Swear by something pretty important, but, but not God's name. That way you could get out of it if things got uncomfortable. And Jesus lists them here, some of them. He says, they would swear by heaven. They'd say, I call upon heaven as my witness. I will repay you if you loan me this money. I call upon heaven as my witness. Uh, and, they would, and, and they would call upon earth. They would say, I swear by God's creation that I will be true to this. They would call upon Jerusalem. I, I, call, I take an oath in the name of Jerusalem that, that I will be true to this matter. They would even swear by their own head. I swear by my own head that I will make restitution. And then when things got uncomfortable, they would say, well, I didn't swear in the Lord's name. I can get out of this. And they'd get out of it. Why'd they teach this? Well, it's pretty simple. They teach it because they like to lie. All right? Don't we all? Jesus tore the foundation out from under their house of cards, though, because he shows them that no matter what they swore by, no matter what they said, God was their witness, whether they invoked him or not. Uh, he says here in verse 34, he says, Swear not at all, neither by heaven. There's the first example. Why? For it is God's throne nor by earth. Why? Because it is His footstool. Neither by Jerusalem. Why? Because it's the city of the great King. Don't swear by your head. Why? Because that you can't make one hair white or black. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying since heaven is God's throne, when you swear by heaven, you swear by God. You're, take, you're, you're, you're uh, taking His throne and associating what is God's with your word. Just like associating His name is associating what God, what's God is with your word. He says, since earth is God's footstool, swearing by God's creation, swearing by God's footstool is the same as taking God's name. He says, since Jerusalem is God's city, then taking Jerusalem as an oath is just as binding as swearing by God's name. It's His city. You're associating Him with your oath. He says, since your head is really created by God and it's in God's hands and... and uh, Back then, they didn't have hair dye, so you can't make uh, the, the, head, uh, the hair black or white. I know uh, some people uh, like to change that, I, I guess. But uh, anyway, I'm just lucky when I comb my hair. But uh, people can do that now. But back then, they, you know, they didn't do it. He says, you can't. It's God's head. You can't swear by that. It's the same as invoking God's name. And so the Pharisees had made other... So this isn't exhaustive. The Pharisees had made other more intricate pathways to dishonesty in their oaths. Let me give you Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 through 22. Uh, Jesus would, would really get on their case in this regard. He says, Woe unto you, ye blind guides which say, listen to what they taught. They say this, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. You can get out of that. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is dead, or you can't get out of that. Isn't that kind of silly? Jesus exposes that. He says, Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, they taught, it is nothing, it's not binding. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is on it, he is guilty. He said, if you swear by the altar, you can get out of it. If you swear by the offering, the sacrifice on the altar, that's binding. 
Jesus says, Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and all things thereon. And who shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and him that sitteth thereon. So they're trying to split hairs. All through both of those passages, they had come up with ways they could get out of oaths. Jesus says the temple is not a building. Or, or he says that the temple is, or they taught the temple is not binding if you swear by it, but the gold is. The altar is not binding, but the offering is. Now you see that's kind of hypocritical, isn't it? But we just do stupid stuff to, to, uh, to justify our own dishonesty. Jesus brushes all that nitpicking about, aside, and he says no matter what you say, no matter what you swear by, God is your witness. Jesus, is in effect, is saying it doesn't matter how much you manipulate the situation. God is witness to your lies whether you take His name or not. Because He owns it all. Everything is connected to God in some way. You know, when you were a child, did you ever make an insincere promise? How did you do that? It's probably the same way I did it. Here's what... Here's what we would do, us boys, all right? We'd go, hey, Jimmy, I'll tell you who I like if you tell me who you like first. And Jimmy would say, I like Susie. And he'd say, ah, I'm not telling you. You promised. Mm -mm. I had my fingers crossed, right? Fell victim to that many times. Uh, anyway, you know what? The Pharisees were more elaborate about it, but at the, the bottom line is they, were, they just like to cross their fingers. Now, wait a minute. The Pharisees weren't less human than us. They weren't like these evil beasts that, that were different than us, that had a different makeup. No, they were human, and they did what they did because they were sinful human beings seeking to justify themselves, seeking to clear their own conscience without, here's the key, without repenting of their sin and living in the light of God's righteousness. And Christians have the same sinful tendencies. I like to cross my fingers too. We're, we're not as elaborate as the Pharisees, but we, have all, we all have our own little system. Our system is simply this. The harder the truth gets to tell, get it, the harder it is to tell the truth, the more we kind of give ourselves a break for not telling it. Um, we think, you know, a little... I think a little, uh, we think God will understand it. We're under grace, you know. Um, we know that God is our witness, but we think, ah, he understands. No, he's holy and he's righteous. He does understand, but he judges by his standards. See, we, uh, we think, well, taxes, those, you know, Uncle Sam, he's wasting the money anyway. I'll cheat on my taxes. Uh, how about repeating unfounded rumors? I know it's true because so-and-so said it and so-and-so wouldn't tell a lie. Uh, little white lies between husband and wife, parents and children. You know what? All little, all little white lies are big black sins. You know that? You can always be honest, though, if you believe that God is always your witness. And remembering three key truths helps us to be always honest and helps us to believe it. You have to remember that God is your witness when you tell the truth. This is encouragement. I mean, it's, it, is, it is helps us to be true to what God says and to be honest with what God says and to, and to say even when it doesn't seem to work out, I can trust God as my witness to tell, when I tell the truth. But we also have to remember the key truth that God is our witness when we tell a lie, when we live a lie, when we... When we express a lie in any way. And then the final key truth to remember in all this, Jesus says, remember that God holds every word to His standard of righteousness. Not ours. He doesn't fit it into our system. When He says tell the truth, He means always. He means tell, uh, uh, you are to be fully invested in the truth, not just in your little justification. It must pass before God. It must uh, it must 
be uh, righteous in his court. Look back with me in verse 20 here, the big idea of Jesus' sermon. He says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And as, ha as he exposes their righteousness, and he exposes their lack of righteousness, here in their lying, here in their dishonesty, we see how high God's standard is for our integrity. His standard is perfection. Jesus says in verse 37, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means yes means yes and no means no, right? And anything you say, you should say what you mean. And if people know you for that, guess what? You'll never have to take an oath. Unless you go to court, you might have to swear on the Bible, but uh, he says you don't have to try and embellish or establish your credibility. It'll already be there. All you have to do is say yes or no. And he says in the end of this, he says, whatsoever is more than these, more than yes or no, cometh of evil. He's saying if you have to say more than yes or no to have credibility, then that is the result of evil. Or he could, you could even say that is something from the evil one. That is, that is something that has come from Satan, the father of lies. You could trace it all the way back to him. Oaths are there. Oaths are for liars when they're taken flippantly all the time. Remember, God's righteousness demands perfection. Psalm 51 and verse 6 says this, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts shalt make me to know wisdom. Revelation 21 verse 8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and listen to this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know what that Bible says right there? No liar has a place in God's kingdom. Liars are not kingdom citizens. You ever told a lie? Yeah, me too. All right? The Bible says that liars have their part in the lake of fire. This is what God is talking about in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 where He says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why is this? Because God is perfect in righteousness. He is, he is, he is excellent in holiness. He is unsurpassed. And whatever system that we come up with to justify our sins will not pass when we die and stand before God. He holds His holy word. His, he holds our every word to His holy and righteous standard. The Pharisees tried to justify themselves before God. God uh, didn't recognize it. They came up with their own application of His law and guess what? They were guilty. So we're all guilty before the Almighty God, the Holy God, the Righteous God. And that's why He provided salvation. You know, lost, you know why people have to be saved? Because they're lost. Because we're born in sin, in our trespasses and sins. We're born sinners, liars by nature. It is, it is bred into our hearts in our sin. We are destined in that to an eternity in hell, says God's Word. And that's what we deserve. But God commended His love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you try to justify yourself before God, though, then the blood of Christ is not applied to you. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God made a way for you to escape the fires of hell. He sent Jesus Christ to pay for your sin on the cross. As they come to bring the invitation here, let me just give you a couple of thoughts in closing. Jesus, by His death, made salvation available to you. All you have to do is repent 
and turn to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive the free gift of eternal life that He has given for you. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says this, Neither is there salvation in any other, but there is none other name given... There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I receive that gift? Acknowledge you're a sinner and repent of your sins, Romans 3.23. We've all fallen short. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that He is God, that He is Lord, that He is your Savior. In Acts 16.31, somebody asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? What did they say? They said, get baptized. No, they didn't. They said, take communion. No, they didn't. They said, be good to your neighbor. No, they didn't. They said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then, call upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you received Jesus Christ and been born again this morning, if you'd like to receive the free gift of salvation this morning, when the invitation plays, you come down and meet me at the front. If you don't want to do that, you can take me and I'll take you in my office after the service and I'll show you how you can know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Of course, many of you here under the power of my voice, you are saved and you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior. And here Jesus has shown you two precious promises. One is that God bears witness when you tell the truth. And you can take comfort in that when you suffer at the dishonesty of others. And the, promise, the second promise is a little more stern, and that is God bears witness always when we tell a lie. And so when the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, and it's reproof, we're to respond to that in repentance.